Welcome everybody. Welcome to your world. WSPOS Worldwide Webinar number eight. It is so good to have you here. What a wonderful day. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. We'll have people listening to us from all over the world, all the continents of the world, all together apart. Um, I can't move today going forward without mentioning a couple of things that are important to us. Mahatma Gandhi said, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. And in these past few days, we've seen that the quiet protest of people who can no longer take injustice has shaken the world. We've seen that doctors, medical carers who've given their lives, who, who put themselves at risk, have been threatened and harassed for being possible COVID carriers. We can't take that anymore. In a gentle way, each and every one of you can shake the world by saying, no, no more. It's not enough. Justice is needed in every part of the world. Welcome to your world, WSPOS. Well, on that note, let me take you to what is going to be an amazing uh, webinar today. We have some of the most amazing people who have contributed to pediatric cataract in the world. I want to start with Dr. Abe Basavada. Here he is looking as young as ever with his lovely family. He's director of the Raghudeep Eye Hospital, uh, Iladevi Cataract and IOL Research Center. He trained at, the, uh, at Baroda India and King's College Hospital and Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. And he established cataract as a specialty in 1987. Abe has written so much about pediatric cataract, it's unbelievable. But one of the papers that I think is seminal that uh, Abe wrote is about the randomized control trial about post-operative outcomes in bilateral aphakia and pseudophakia in children up to two years uh, of age, published in 2018. If you haven't read it, read it. David Walton, what can I say about David Walton? David has devoted his life to pediatric glaucoma. He studied engineering at Haverford College and medicine at Duke University Medical School. Did his residency in pediatrics at Boston Children's, his ophthalmology um, a residency and fellowship at Mass Eye and Ear. He founded the Children's Glaucoma Foundation with the assistance of dedicated parents uh, of affected children. He's a treasured mentor. All over the world, people look to him from his uh, writings, his experience. But the thing that I, I, I really admire about him David looks at the basic science of what's going on. And this paper that I show you down there, we're going to talk about this paper because it gives us a perfect reason why children get infantile aphakic glaucoma. Read it. It's an amazing paper. We're going to talk about it a bit. So what can I say about Ramesh Kekanuya that hasn't been said already? Ramesh is a friend, a colleague. He's the head of the Child Sight Institute of Just TV Ramanama Children's Eye Center at LV Prasad Eye Institute. His special interests are complex strabismus, pediatric cataract, pediatric neuro-ophthalmology. But this is the, this is the kicker about uh, Ramesh. He is one of the men with sincerity, integrity that I know in my life that I know I can rely on. So they, uh, Ramesh, thank you so much. And I, uh, I, I want to also point out that Ramesh's work in pediatric cataract is amazing. This is a paper that he wrote about infant pediatric cataract surgery. Please read it. Ramesh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ken, for the introduction. Uh, I will just introduce the rest of the group now. And once again, I welcome everyone uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, this will be an amazing webinar for all of you. I just want to make uh, some announcement before I introduce the other speakers. We have three portals today, uh, Blueberry, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, I'm sure all of you are watching through one of the other port. Uh, you can. I I'm sure all of you must have one or two questions to ask to the panel. Uh, type in your questions wherever you are watching from, and we will try to answer as many as, as possible today. One more important thing, because when we do a webinar, we learn and we, we share the knowledge. To this end, we are asking some questions around the world, how we are doing, how is our management protocol. 
So I want every one of you to open this uh, browser on your browser, www.menti.com. Open it on your browser. You will see something like this when you open the menti.com. There'll be a area space for passcode. Today's passcode is double six six seven nine six. Once you enter and hit the submit button, you will see the questions for today. Throughout the webinar, we will be asking seven questions today. You can answer at any stage, but I will announce when I am putting the questions there. So try to answer. More answers we'll get. We will, uh, we will know what's the trend everywhere in the world. So try to do it. And you can also, this is the QR code you can utilize uh, if you want to directly go into the website. So I sincerely request everybody to download this and then uh, uh, answer. Uh, coming to the introduction part, uh, Ken uh, is a co-moderator today. He is uh, one of uh, very good friend we have, and he is also a executive director of WSPOS. He is born in Nairobi, but uh, grew up in uh, England. Now he is in USA, Pittsburgh, but uh, he's always uh, Qatar Punjabi by heart. Uh, it's a pleasure to have him uh, today. And uh, we have gone through a journey for so many years, or maybe more than a decade now. Currently, he's a professor of ophthalmology and division chief of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at UPMC Children's, Pittsburgh. He is also a medical director of uh, digital health, UPMC Children, and also vice chair of quality at the UPMC Eye Center. He has contributed significantly to pediatric cataract. Uh, all the speakers today, some or the other way, have contributed to the pediatric cataract management. And this is the reference you can see, two incision push-pull uh, technique. I uh, recommend all of you to go through that and read. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ragitse Banksgaard. She is a consultant pediatric ophthalmologist at Copenhagen uh, University Hospital, Denmark. She has a special interest in uh, ROP, uveitis, and pediatric cataract. And you can see the reference here. This is one of the, the great work she has done. Uh, she has taught all of us to be careful about this particular uh, entity of topical ocular corticosteroids. She's going to talk about that, and it's a pleasure to have her today. Uh, as I'm introducing, you can see already the Menti questions, one or two Menti questions already will be there, so you can ans uh, start answering the questions. Uh, our last speaker for today is Dr. Boris Malyukjin. He's a professor of ophthalmology at St. Fedorov Eye Microsurgery State Institution, Moscow, Russia. He's also a president of Russian Ophthalmology Society, and he has pioneered numerous techniques and technologies for cataract surgery. Uh, two of the most important one was uh, Malugin ring for pupil expansion and Malugin modified CTR. And uh, you can all read about more about this in India Journal of Ophthalmology, which is an open access uh, for everybody. Uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Boris Malugin uh, to give his uh, first talk. As he is uh, uh, preparing and sharing his screen, you can uh, answer one more question on Menti. Uh, that is the third question. So. Uh, there are three questions at this point of time. Yeah, we will go back and forth so you can answer. Over to you, Dr. Boris Maliuti. I think you'll have to unmute, Boris. Boris, can you unmute? While we're waiting for um, Boris to uh, get his presentation together, uh, Abi, if you have a small pupil, how do you normally deal with that? You know, small pupil is not uncommon, as we all know, in children, either from the beginning or they become small with this immature uvular tissue. And I, my primary first choice is the Greisheber iris hooks that I use uh, in these small eyes, because many of these are small dimension and anterior segment as well. So when it's 
small, tiny incisions of 0.2 millimeter or 0.3. These hooks serve me very well. So that's my primary first choice for okay. pupil expansion. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure we're going to learn a lot about it now from Boris. All right, Boris, we'll use. Okay. Position. Iris hooks already been mentioned by Abai. Uh, they are very popular in uh, both pediatric and adult cataract surgery. Uh, however, uh, the issues with the pediatric cataract surgery is that there are, uh, there are um, sometimes poor exposure due to narrow palpebral fissure. Uh, we also need to keep in mind that there is a need for, to create four additional incisions that may require additional suturing and prolongation of the surgical procedure. Uh, usually with um, um, uh, iris hooks, there is a tendency to overextend the pupillary margin, and that's why the surgical time is longer. Uh, it is showed in the literature, mostly related to age-related cataract, that uh, uh, in most cases, pupil extension rings are much easier to use. They require less operating time, do not require extra incisions. Uh, pupil expansion rings provide stable pupil during surgery and minimizing postoperative pupil deformity. There are different uh, pupil expansion rings that you may consider using. This is one of them that I created uh, uh, more than 10 years ago. It's quite uh, widely used all over the world. However, there are currently available other products from different companies, uh, uh, it's not much being, uh, they are not very much being studied in pediatric cataract surgery. And actually, um, in, in adult cataract surgery, uh, the pupil expansion ring, uh, such as this one, uh, showed to be more effective um, with regard to the time sparing. As you can see, both um, trainees and consultants has the tendency to have less operating time with the, uh, with the Malugin ring uh, rather than um, the iris hooks. And the time difference was 10 minutes. So that 10 minutes, um, uh, it's quite long time when the young child is under general anesthesia. Uh, in spite of the fact that this um, uh, device is square, it provides almost a circular opening of the pupil because there is a uh, holding points in addition to two points at the angles of the device. There is one more point uh, that is in between where the thread is going from the upper portion of the iris to the uh, back portion of the iris. So the, that actually equals to eight iris hooks, which is uh, very important because we like to have the pupil round and uh, nice, uh, nicely fixated in eight uh, points. There is only one publication of using the Malugin ring in pediatric cataract surgery, and this refers to Luke Clifford and Peter Hodgkins, uh, and they wrote a letter uh, recommending uh, to use this device in, uh, uh, in, in, in pediatric cataract surgery. They were using the first version of the device, which is a little bit uh, uh, stiffer and a little bit more bulky than the second version, which I do like to use more in pediatric cataract surgery because in thinner thread, it is more compressible. And uh, this is the force that is needed to compress to ends. And we see that the second version is more compressible, having increased gap, and it's easier to implant and to remove. So this is the clinical case uh, representing the a small pupil after injection of uh, We seem to into be the anterior to chamber as shown here. Is it okay? It's fine, it's fine. It's a little bit slower, yes, because of... Is it... It's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Okay. As shown here on, on, on this video, uh, it might be a little bit delayed because of the internet connection. However, we can see that the, uh, the ring is now being implanted um, uh, with the help of the uh, side port instrument, which is the ring manipulator. Uh, the uh, scrolls of the device are engaged one by one. Um, with the iris uh, margin, 
And uh, at the end, we have a nice round pupil. Uh, there are two form factors of that device, six and a quarter and seven. And obviously, in pediatric cataract cases, uh, I do like six and a quarter, the smaller device, uh, uh, because the dimensions of the anterior segment of the eye, especially in the younger patients, might be um, uh, not as uh, uh, we, we, we face in, in adult cataract surgery. Um, capsulotomy is, a, is always challenging in pediatric cases, and uh, uh, I like to initiate it with the sharp bent needle and then follow with my micro capsulorexis forceps um, around creating very nice circular capsulotomy. Uh, irrigation aspiration, um, usually I do by manual. Uh, there is uh, um, uh, no um, any issues with that because we have a good exposure of the uh, mid-equatorial portion of the uh, capsular bag here and we 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 are sure that the uh, the cortical material is completely evacuated uh, from from the capsular bag a single piece hydrophobic acrylic is implanted inside the capsular bag and positioned properly and it's time to remove the device uh, right now Clearly having some connectivity problems, uh, Boris. Here. We're slightly frozen here. So um, while we're waiting for the video to come back okay. on. Can I? Yep, that's it. We've got you back. Uh, to show you how the device is being disengaged from uh, from the pupil and uh, uh, the the extraction of the device from the anterior chamber is being done with the same injector. Vitrectomy uh, is the uh, last steps of the surgery to open the capsule and to make uh, uh, a little bit of uh, anterior vitrectomy in order to prevent the um, uh, the op op optical axis opacification. So this is just a short summary of what was being said. Uh, second generation can be indicated for moderately dilated pupil on pediatric cases, uh, while first generation classic is better to use with thicker and uh, um, uh, stronger and uh, stiffer irises. So to summarize my talk, um, it's, it's good to consider appropriate mediatic protocol, intracameral injection of mediatic agent, utilizing highly viscous ophthalmic viscosurgical device. So I'm, I'm going to take over now, and uh, uh, Boris, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you so much. I, I have used the Malugan ring. Um, it, 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 it is very effective. Um, uh, in, my, in my hands, I, I like to use it in children who are uh, like over the age of two years old. Uh, have you used it in infants? Yes, uh, I, have a, uh, I have a chance to use it in the younger patients, and... Uh, I must say that it uh, equally works well. Uh, of course, if you if you have very small kids, like six months, it's a bit challenging because the dimension of the anterior segment is not uh, not appropriate for that. But uh, something starting from six months and uh, older, uh, that's okay. Uh, Ramesh, what about you? Do you do you, do you use the Malugan ring at all, or do you use the Grease Harbor? Um um, uh, um, uh, iris hooks and I, I have to say none of us have a conflict of interest with Grease Harbor obviously Malugin ring is Boris's uh, product yeah. so that's uh, yeah. that's an uh, 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 interest but uh, Ramesh what about you? Yeah uh, Ken uh, I, I think uh, if the pupil is healthy normal we try to use uh, intracameral diluted uh, 
any kind of agents and then the viscoelastic makes it better that's number one if the iris is not healthy because in india still we have lot of uh, rubella children there probably uh, we use grashaber hook and even in some cases even that's not because when we use it it can break the iris so we'll have to do a pupilloplasty as well so my choice is as much as possible i'll try to dilate with the, some kind of uh, mechanical uh, or the pharmacological agent second is uh, grashaber hook and then in extreme cases we we have uh, uh, you know pupilloblast these are my choices and uh, before we go on to the next uh, thing i just wanted to make one correction with the menti code because i don't want everybody to go wrong the menti code is 656696 that is 656696 for everybody to answer question number 1 2 3 will be there for the next 1 minute and then we will have 4 and 5 later thank you go ahead ken yeah. so uh, abey let me ask you um one of the things that i worry about um is making too many holes in a young child's eye because the more holes you make the more sutures you have yeah. to use so do you use three when you're using hooks or because that's what i like about the malugin no, no, i think uh, yeah i think no. that your question is very valid and i must say malugin ring is, is fabulous and uh, and it is the kind of device we all should be using when the end segment has some decent dimension which could yes. be challenging as boris mentioned in a very young age but but that is a great advantage more malukin ring has and it's one of the best of the kind i use the uh, grashaber who iris uh, and that needs not more than 0.2 or 0.3 mm in so we don't need suturing but i suture otherwise 1 mm paracentesis and and you all and you learn from you guys that you must suture everything and must remove it also as early but not too late kind of thing so so that suturing is not an issue but but retracting like any other technique needs some experience and a skill you don't want to over stretch stretch enough so that you know it does for your size If you yeah. if you pull it, yeah, the, and and with and with ring also, if if it's you know, it can. So be very judicious and very careful, very tender pull, sufficient but not too much. You know, it, it it works well. But but I cannot agree more with Boris. That this is the way we all should be going. Boris, can I ask you? So there are people listening around the world, um, and they're not going to know what you mean by intracameral dilation. Now, you, you do you have any specific details? preservative free are you using phenylephrine are you using adrenaline should you check with the anesthesia before you inject it what sort of things should we be doing uh, if we're going to use intracameral dilation um intracameral dilation my my personal preference is 1% phenylephrine so this is what we use for many years uh, since i was resident i was seeing that technique and it's uh, still there uh also um as you know in europe uh, there is a commercially available uh combination of uh, um phenylephrine a non steroidal drug and lidocaine so it's uh, approved for commercial use and for sale so this is the one because the one that i use phenylephrine is uh, uh obviously preservative free however it's not it's not for ophthalmic use so um And and what dose do you use? 0.1 mL? Do you what do you know how much you use? Yeah, uh 1% 0.1 mL uh intracameral. Okay. And uh, Ramesh and Abhi, any comments on any intracameral dilation that you use? Uh, I I use uh, adrenaline diluted intracardiac adrenaline diluted uh, so that uh, it has no side effects. But I also want to bring out the value of adaptive OVD helon 5 it really dilates and particularly if there is a white cataract and which is quite not uncommon in these children when in our part of the world that helon five does the great trick for dilating a pupil but also uh, counteracting the the interlentricular pressure elast so i think uh, the combination of all these pharmacologicals and ovds and all the tricks whatever you learn uh, generally works but there are eyes where we i wish i had mastered boris's ring <laughs> you know ramesh i'm going to hand it over to you now for the rest of the program i i just had one comment about what i use 
Sure, we sorry. Use, uh, for the fluid, we inject very diluted amount, uh, very little. I don't dilute again and inject intracamerally. Same fluid I take, and uh, the jet of flow should be directed to the pupil in different quadrant. It usually dilates very well. Thank you so much. I think uh, we need to move on. Uh, I invite Dr. Vasavada to talk about uh, the angle in children with the pediatric cataract surgery. So followed by uh, Dr. Uh, David Walton. So we will have questions uh, after both the talks. As uh, Dr. Vasavada is beginning his talk, we have uh, one question on gonioscopy and one question on the preferred mode of surgery. What do you prefer in patients with uh, FAKK or pseudo-FAKK glaucoma? I want all the audience to look at the questions and answer. We will go back and forth. Still now there are five questions. If you have not answered, please answer. The Minty code is 656696. Dr. Vasavada, all yours. Uh, this is my financial interest and uh, recognize the contribution of uh, Dr. Deepa Agrawal, uh, Dr. Renal Pandit and the team at Raghu Deepai Hospital, Ahmedabad and Jaipur. The reason I, I selected and can uh, suggest it also, uh, the angle in children with childhood cataract is that I believe 80% of the surgeries in pediatric childhood cataracts are done by the cataract surgeons. They are not necessarily a devoted pediatric ophthalmologist. So they do it as a technical procedure of a cataract uh, in pediatric and the management overall uh, is, is conspicuously lacking in many areas, including the glaucoma and the glaucoma really goes undiagnosed and we'll, we are looking forward for uh, Davis's presentation after this. So, so that was the motive that I thought will bring it out uh, why we should be looking into the angle and why it's so important. I think we know that the surgery has unpredictable and sometimes horrendous impact on the eye in general, but particularly on this angle which is developing. Is immature is developing in, in younger children. And remember, the uveal tissue and the blood aqueous barrier is so immature and fragile that, that all the nasty mediators really make it even more worse. Uh, I believe incidence of glaucoma after pediatric cataract varies a lot, but definitely it's more than 10%, surely. Uh, and therefore, it, it, it's not only diagnosing and anticipating during the, for the surgery, but demands a long-term follow-up and monitoring, uh, assessing angle and all the sort of glaucoma stuff, which we'll hear very soon. So just to remind you that uh, uh, in the third trimester, uh, the trabecular mesh work is uh, way behind. Swalbe's line is just here, and the whole mesh of uh, huge mesodermal tissue is covering the whole thing there and then gradually the trabecular measure keeps getting exposure as the as the mesodermal tissue regresses and, and at, at the birth uh, this is what it is uh, it's, it's quite open now but there is quite often a very thin layer and there is a name given to this thin layer of uh, mesodermal tissue and remember that that regression may not be complete and that is what we see quite often in otherwise healthy eyes, healthy children with just an isolated cataract. So I think this is uh, uh, worth remembering why you see this. But uh, this chapter in this book has uh, uh, very categorically done some studies and mentioned that it continues to develop at least up to two years. And I, I agree, I can't agree more. Uh, and the recess, which is very familiar to adult glaucoma, appears anytime at three years and, and so on. So I think, remember that when you actually do the gonioscopy, but you can also do assessment of angle uh, and document it. I think if you document it either with a video, which is the easiest thing to do, uh, you can always compare it in a post-operative time in case, in case you need to, in, in, to titrate the response, you got it uh, down the line later on. So I would recommend uh, a procedure what uh, I am very fond of is EUA, examination under anesthesia, 
But be careful, you don't have to keep doing you every time because of the neurotoxicity and liver if you, get, you use some other gases. So you need to use it at least for preoperative assessment for not only angle, but the, but the corneal diameter and, and so many things uh, as a baseline documentation. And this is a fairly common appearance at six months a uh, very prominent uh, iris process with this sterile spur, uh, not a great recess, but still it's very easily appreciable. And as the time goes, you, you will see more and more. So this is a fully developed mature angle. And if you see that, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about the response. And you can also assess the angle in many situations, along with the gonioscopy of the OCT. And we saw that earlier with Boris's and also the UVM. Uh, which will tell you how well or otherwise the angle is developed. So this is an incomplete regression of mesodermal mm, tissue and dysgenesis, and you need to keep in mind when you do a cataract. Even if you've done the common, simple, uh, straightforward procedure, you may be surprised. But if you see such a thing where really there is a poor differentiation and, and uh, you can make out there is an anterior iris insertion, which you can confirm, uh, even on a UBM. So we believe that uh, these kind of procedures uh, uh, should be done repeatedly, not only in one time, one point, to assess the and monitor. And we do this EUA's gonioscopy quite often during post-operative also, not in every case, of course, but, but whenever we have a doubt. So with good anesthetics, good gases, make sure your health is not compromised. Don't repeat very soon. Give some breathing time for the body tissues, which could be three months or whatever, to repeat. And if you keep monitoring, sometimes when the, the very good blab and whatever you see is not working, you can identify why it is not doing it, plugging the window, and, and, and you feel, oh, wish I had a, a different iridectomy or whatever. So I'm going to very narrate very quickly a unilateral cataract done at five months, very good surgery, everything fine. And uh, the preoperative and the postoperative angles were very normal, undisturbed. And this is what we wish that it happens. No IOP, no glaucoma, nothing. And, and, and everything went on very well. And uh, you can always, uh, it's nice to see that uh, everything is very stable and well positioned. So UVM uh, helps, but UVM really helps in the secondary IOL, where you've done a plantar fakia. And if you want to see the spaces behind the iris, so many ring and is is can I put it in front of the capsular remnant behind the iris or a scleral fixation? Uh, UVM and uh, I'm a fan of UVM as well. Uh, developmental. Uh, the, this is a one year old uh, uh, child operated. Developed six months down the line. IOP in spite of uh, uneventful period until that time. And we could manage the glaucoma, fortunately, with medicine. And this was this preoperative dysgenetic angle. And we were very conscious of that. And we, we identified that very soon. We had one more EUA in case for early detection. And we were lucky that we did it. Because these surgical trauma add to that uh, uh, process, which is already pre-existing and will make it worse for the IOP, and you can identify the summoning rings here in spite of beautiful in the bag and so on. So I think uh, monitoring these, even by a cataract surgeon, will give you some idea, and you can always take help of your colleagues, and uh, I'm sure uh, the expert faculty here will oblige you if you send them their pictures. So this is a case, last case, a four months of age. I had a difficult implantation, and, and, and Ramesh has produced a wonderful paper uh, performance under six months, and it is a performance in the six months or a year that we all are interested in for the reasons we know very well. I had to do a sulcus fixation. The preoperative angle was not bad uh, at that point, four months age, and we thought it's quite fine, but because of the traumatic uh, performance and the persistent trauma by the ciliary sulcus fixation, developed the rise in IOPs fairly soon, and then we did a uh, we did more investigations, and we, we are not surprised why he done it. It's a 360-degree uh, total cementing, plastering of the anterocyanica because of the difficult surgery, immature uval tissue pouring out and giving inflammation. And you can recognize that again in UVM with peripheral cyanica, 
and also the posterior sinus, and no wonder now you have a problem. So we did a trabeculectomy, but uh, as expected, it failed. And I, I really like this uh, small side amygdala, and we do it quite often in this complicated scenario using using uh, a cutoplast and all sorts of things. Dr. Renal does it at our center. So finally, I must bring out the limitation, and the limitation is this mindset. Doing a UN, and it takes about 45 minutes to do a complete list of examination. And how can you do every time that's one? It needs a team of people, optometrists, the retina, the glaucoma guy. And more importantly, and Ken has uh, taught me this a few years ago, that be careful about the, the effect on the body, the, the neurotoxicity, and in good old days, the liver. So uh, uh, do not repeat unless you have to and give a, a decent time in between. But having said that, I think as a cataract surgeon, as a comprehensive 80% of my colleagues, and I'm one of that, I'm not a pediatric ophthalmologist, I think uh, keep, there is an angle structure there and, and, and look at it or ask somebody to look at it before you operate and document it and keep it with you in case you need it uh, for further, further monitoring, even if everything is okay. And, and uh, you need to repeat these uh, different kinds of uh, examination depending upon the complexity uh, with EUA in a very selected cases with all the concerns uh, that we learned. So I really thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you so much. That, that was fantastic. Uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move straight on to David Walton. Uh, we'll be talking and hopefully discussing a little bit more about that angle assessment. Um, David, uh, if you'd like to share your slides. Abhi, if you could stop sharing your slides, please. Yes. Fantastic. So um, I, I think that anesthesia is an issue. There are ways of uh, examining children uh, where you can uh, avoid um, uh, too many anesthesias, but we, we can talk about that. Um, I, I think that was a, that was a really useful uh, talk in terms of assessing the angle. Uh, David, whenever you're ready, please just um, uh, uh, load up your talk. So I, I think one of the things you can do, in ch well, and I'm just going to talk while David's loading up, one of the things that you can do in younger children, normally under the age of around about 14 months, is that you can ask the parents not to feed them for about four hours before they come to your clinic. Then you feed them, and while you're feeding them, while they're being fed, they actually allow you to examine them very nicely. And in, I've done gonioscopies, I've measured pressures while the child is being, you know, immediately post-feeding, and I call that exam under sleep. D uh, David, how are we doing? Can, uh, I think I'm Can you stop sharing your screen? Because it's still being uh, shared. So mm -hmm. that's why Dr. Walton's slide yeah. is not. So please uh, unshare. Unshare at the top. Me? Yeah. Yes. That's right, Abhi. I can't do that. I'm... I'm uh... You, you if, can if you go to the very top of the screen. Yes, I did it. There we are. Now we're there. Fantastic. Yes. David, you're on. Good morning. I, I'm truly humbled and, and pleased to be a part of this group. You all are, are so knowledgeable. And uh, well, what I'd like to do in a few minutes is present a few facts and some observations to stimulate our thinking and possibly some questions as well. Uh, this is serious business, uh, congenital cataract surgery, and it's, uh, as we all know, and I really appreciate the comments and learned a great deal already, it's, uh, it's really humbling. There are estimated 200,000 blind cataract children in the world. Congenital cataract is a leading cause of legal blindness under five years of age worldwide, uh, making up approximately 16% of all the patients. Uh, it's been estimated that uh, 20,000 congenital cataract infants are born each year. Okay. Infantile aphasic glaucoma, I will be calling this problem uh, infantile. It's also pseudophagic, but uh, to, uh, to put just a shorter slide up, we're calling this problem infantile aphasic glaucoma through this presentation. It's crucial to understand that this is a secondary glaucoma. 
this is it's not secondary to anomalies it's not secondary to other things secondary glaucoma is the effect of having the nippy lensectomy infantile aphasic glaucoma it's the most frequent complication of congenital cataract surgery it's the most significant cause of blindness after infant cataract surgery there are mechanisms of this glaucoma and historically this has really changed in earlier years before the 1980 1970 pupillary block was rampant and my mentors here in boston recommended multiple iridectomies to try to eliminate this problem more recently uh the uh mechanism of the glaucoma has been named open angle and it's now the most common perhaps representing an over 90 percent of the patients when gonioscopy is done as we've heard minor angle anomalies are seen but i don't think that they represented causes of the glaucoma excessive steroid use is uh, potentially significant and i don't think yet we fully understand just how significant that is relative to the mechanism of this glaucoma it uh just in quick review open angle means that the iris is not next to the back of the cornea and it's understandable that the gonioscopy of these patients has uh, considered that this is an open angle which when one looks at the trabecular meshwork as we've already seen in the beautiful pictures presented by abe that sometimes that's so much not true when you consider whether or not the trabecular meshwork is exposed to the anterior chamber but open angle is such that the iris is not generally next to the back of the cornea compared to pupillary block uh, which was seen so much historically when much lens material was left in the eye and the iris became uh, frozen to the residual tissue blocking the exit of aqueous from the posterior chamber into the anterior chamber raising the iris and obstructing the trabecular meshwork by closing the angle so to really understand what's going on here in the minutes that i have gonioscopy as we've already heard is really important and i couldn't echo enough dr vasavada's recommendation to do gonioscopy so you're familiar with doing it and particularly doing it prior to surgery so you can really understand for the first time what the changes are and uh, this is it this is that procedure being done in the operating room and uh, i find kepi lenses of various sizes to, to be very helpful uh, and uh, it, uh, it's an excellent technique it, uh, for looking at the angle uh, i've already seen better pictures than mine but th th now we're getting into what it might look like with infantile aphagic glaucoma and you'll see residual lens tissue in the pupil which should not be overlooked the iris has some defects which i'll show you and when you look at the angle the uh the predominant finding is a forward movement of of the iris now that picture is a little bit hard to understand so i did this drawing to try to make what some of the defects might be more clear and you can see what might be a more normal angle on the left side of the screen where in fact trabecular meshwork squirrel spur and soy body band is visible and the, the pathology uh, of this change in the angle is a circumferential forward insertion of the iris and you can see these micro synechia along the trabecular meshwork it's somewhat variable circumferentially but this is the change and interestingly this occurs quite quickly it may not finish its march uh, uh, quickly but it, it begins in the first month after surgery and the defect in the angle here is is that the peripheral iris is is attached to the uh, trabecular meshwork there's also scattered pigment in the uh, trabecular meshwork and so that, uh, when i did a study of, of uh, unilateral bilateral these are bilateral patients and just to compare preoperative uh, findings with postoperative findings and the weight represents normal and unfortunately uh, uh, some of the patients did not have gonioscopy when we did this review prior to surgery but the the slide does show the uh, approximately 90 percent presence of angle abnormality in these bilateral glaucoma patients after infant cataract surgery and what were the abnormalities well the most common one was uh, forward insertion of the iris uh, pigment in the trabecular meshwork and sometimes you'll see even residual uh, small pieces of iris tissue in the angle as well and uh, 
the pathology of this condition is hard to get, but this is a representative slide showing uh, the uh, forward attachment of the iris to the trabecular meshwork. And uh, it, it, uh, when one considers what's going on, and, and that's really getting to the heart of the problem, what is causing this? It's absolutely clue to, to give this some consideration, and I hope you all will think about this and forward your ideas. The, 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 the changes do not, are not isolated to the iris, but frequently when you look at the pupillary border, you will see a necropion that, that has now formed after the surgery, and the iris from itself looks monotonous. It doesn't have the normal crypts necessarily, and, and then when you look into the angle, you, you'll see the changes that I've talked about. This slide on the left might be of some interest, but you can see the ectropion around the pupil, but interestingly, an ectropion formed around the iridectomy and give some consideration to that in terms of what's going on on the iris surface that might have done made that to happen. And uh, when one looks into the pupil in patients who had surgery, you see this white ring. And uh, there was no white ring there prior to the surgery. And you should also give consideration to where the collagen is coming from, which allows the border and fusion of the anterior and posterior capsules to now be uh, accentuated by a white ring. Uh, I, I think that what uh, may be going in, on, as suggested above, is that lens cells uh, are becoming fibroblasts, and lens cells, as we've learned, also uh, do different things and uh, injure the uh, trabecular meshwork primarily in their transition from being innocent lens cells two cells of a different type. And uh, just in brief, what might that process be? You have lens cells now in the anterior chamber and everywhere, and they are affected by a tsunami of cytokines, be it TGF-beta, FGH, uh, VEGA, and these cells change rapidly, and they become myofibroblasts. And this is a, just another uh, drawing suggesting what's going on uh, in terms of producing these changes of the iris surface, the atropia, the senecule attachment to the angle, and primary changes within the, the trabecular meshwork itself. You have lens epithelial cells. They're affected by cytokines and their freedom in the anterior chamber. They form myofibroblasts uh, under the influence of multiple cytokines uh, and then uh, cause fibrosis in the affected tissues. This is an amazing slide, uh, and I found this. It's by a author, Song in Nature Research, 2017, uh, and this is a post-operative pathology, and it's very, uh, it's really a, a treasured presentation. And what one sees, is for looking first at the pupillary border, is a very evident ectropion. And then as one looks more to the periphery of the angle, you can see organization of the iris surface, and then these attachments to the, the trabecular meshwork and forward insertion of the, uh, of the iris to the trabecular meshwork. This represents the clinical pathology of infantile fecal glaucoma. And uh, infantile fecal glaucoma can be treated medically and phosphine iodide, so-called ectothiophate phosphate is a very useful medication. And I hope it gets back soon. And uh, gonia, gonia surgery can be quite helpful. Uh, and I think uh, it may work best when the uh, glaucoma is recognized early. Uh, and uh, But I found this to be a very helpful uh, procedure uh, for these patients. And so I'd like the prevention of this is really what we're going to get to. This condition, this development of this, this, uh, which is the cause of blindness in so many children worldwide, this has to stop. Uh, and uh, it, uh, we have to be able to do this uh, surgery safely. Uh, and I hope that time is not too far away. Things to consider is to avoid the lens surgery. Every study has just shown a much higher incidence of glaucoma when the surgery is performed early. You have to balance this with visual development, which uh, is uh, an active consideration. Avoid lens surgery before eight weeks of age seems like a reasonable consideration. One must get the lens material out as much as possible. So you, you want to have the pupil well dilated and you want to have the instruments, in my opinion, in the posterior chamber so you can move the, the removal instrument with freedom from left to right. 
uh, one wants as a goal to remove as much lens cortex and the villainous uh, uh, lens cells, particularly those lining the back of the anterior capsule. And uh, there's, uh, you can be disappointed and sometimes there'll be res considerable residual lens tissue left that, uh, and, and in my view, I think one has to be aggressive about that and go back and take it out. The, 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 I use minimal steroids, and I think we're going to hear more about that, and I think this is a very important consideration. The frequent and prolonged use of steroids after surgery, it seems uh, of small value, in my opinion. It, uh, historically, uh, children are always blamed to be more uh, fibrogenic, to have more fibrotic reaction to surgery. I frankly don't see that, and uh, so we can use minimal steroids after surgery and sometimes non-steroidal agents. Uh, I would echo what we've heard already. This uh, condition needs to be monitored, and we have to perform frequent postoperative examinations, and so we can recognize uh, this problem early. Thank you very much for the opportunity to interject this, uh, and uh, I hope it stimulates thinking and uh, and and questions, which we be happy to answer. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, David. If you could stop sharing your screen, uh, we are getting overwhelmed by questions at the moment. I think what we're going to do though is we're going to let uh, Ramesh, would you like to do some menti questions and then we'll get Ragitza to uh, uh, give her valuable uh, talk and then we'll have a discussion. I just want to say we have people listening from Indonesia, Malaysia, South America, you, every country in South America. We've got Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Peru, we have Africa, we have Nigeria, we have uh, South Africa, we have Kenya, Australia, New Zealand, India, Indonesia. Everybody's listening right now, and they are really uh, putting forward lots of questions. Uh, Ramesh, many questions? Yeah, I, I just have one question uh, before Regitse uh, starts speaking. So uh, that's about the glucocorticoids and the topical steroids uh, in pediatric cataract surgery. And in the meantime, some of you have not done the first five questions. We will uh, keep it still open. The Menti code for today is 656696. There was an error in the uh, initial uh, announcement. Uh, Dr. Banskart, you can uh, share your screen and go ahead with your talk. And then we'll have discussion. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about hazards of topical steroids post-infant cataract surgery. We were very surprised in our department in 2011 when we realized that two consecutive patients had developed uh, clinical signs of Cushing. Often after congenital cataract operations, we uh, treat with supraphysiological doses of uh, glucocorticoids and that um, might have after one or two weeks inhibit the hypothalamic pituitary renal axis and actually the, the, it can induce a renal cortex uh, atrophy uh, um, so the child cannot produce a burst of cortisol in case of stress and at the same time, we have these high levels of uh, iatrogenic uh, glucocorticoids, which uh, induce, can induce Cushing over time. And Cushing syndrome in uh, children is um, characterized by sleep disorders, moodiness, hair changes, skin changes, very round face, uh, despite reduced appetite. And after an initial weight gain, the child uh, loses height and weight and can even um, experience high blood glucose levels and high blood pressure. It's a reversible condition if treated properly. Uh, this is our index patient who were diagnosed and treated from six months of age and tested every three months. And she was three and a half year when she had her first normal test. She was treated by tapering her eye drops and uh, substituting her with a tablet hydrocortisone, one milligram three times a day, 
and she had to have additional hydrocortisone in case of physical stress, uh, fever, or general anesthesia. The same patient developed an renal crisis when she looked like this. She had no signs of Cushing syndrome at that time when she was operated in her second eye. She stopped breathing and, uh, and had a very long wake up time, but luckily she came through and was stabilized. A renal insufficiency in infants is characterized by reduced appetite, failure to thrive, and prolonged fever episodes. But what we fear most is the uh, renal crisis that can occur on, during general anesthesia, fever, or stress, and it's a life threatening condition if, if undiagnosed. But it's treatable and preventable. Treatment is intravenous injection of glucocorticoids, saline, and dextrose. Um, our postoperative steroid regimen at that time was uh, after the operation, injection of methyl prednisolone uh, under the uh, conjunctiva, and then um, uh, tapering dexamethasone over a five week period. Because we feared we had a, a, a problem, a systemic problem, we, we decided that all our future patients needed um, a renal corticotropic stimulation test. And in 2018, we uh, published this retrospective study on 26 consecutive patients, which surprisingly showed that two thirds had suppressed a renal function um, postoperatively when treated, uh, tested during treatment. We calculated the cumulative dose of dexamethasone equivalent per weight and found that there was a statistically significant relation between the, the dose and the last five days before testing and a pathological test. Uh, we now have a new three week um, regimen um, without uh, giving any after the operation under the conjunctiva, but only uh, drops afterwards, taper it over three weeks. And we haven't noticed any more complications. At day 21, the children are tested. And again, surprisingly, we still have one third of children with a suppressed renal function, but it's now reduced from two thirds to one third. No ocular steroid is 100% safe irrespective of route and type, uh, and the renal sensitivity varies, probably due to genetic variation in the glucocorticoid receptor gene. And thank you, and hope to see you in Copenhagen next year at the EPOS 2021. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rugita. I really appreciate that. So I, I think we, we have some time now, Ramesh, for some questions, right? So. Uh, let me let me kick off then. So uh, those of you listening right now, and again, we've got people listening from Kazakhstan, Ecuador, Ecuador, Turkey, Mexico, Philippines, Myanmar, from all over the world. Um, I, I think this is there are two two important things that I want to discuss. Uh, these are the subjects that are not normally discussed, but it seems to me that there is a um, an interaction here. If you cause too much inflammation and you leave too many lens epithelial cells behind, you're gonna open yourself up to uh, uh, secondary glaucoma. So the idea of how you handle the pupil is really important, and how you, what you do with your surgery is really important. Um, if we go around, uh, what is the earliest age for lensectomy? We're not talking about implantation, lensectomy. What's the earliest age people on the panel would operate to remove a unilateral cataract? Or, or, or in their experience, have they seen? Abe, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, in my early enthusiastic days, I used to operate at three weeks, four weeks. I given up, and as you heard, David, uh, I wait for at least two months in unilateral cataract, but I would like to wait for at least three months. So anything two months onwards, preferably three months, that I do any surgery, lensectomy or or whatever operation, but. If I have, if you allow me, I just want to comment on David's theory of uh, lens epithelial fibroblasts, and I cannot agree more, but I want to add another dimension. 
What David is talking about is the epithelial mesenchymal transformation, EMT process. But this EMT process is initiated primarily by the very age of the patient, child, the surgical trauma, and the immaturity of the uveal tissue. So I think any flutter of the iris, any slightest touch prolapsing to the sub-small incision, any uveal trauma, however trivial it may appear, and we would even not recognize as uveal trauma, is enough to produce EMT process in lens epithelial cells, damage to the trabecular in the developing angle, and an anterior vitreous phase. So I think EMT process in lens epithelium is an important contribution, but that's not the only one, I believe. And it could be a, a, a cause and effect sometimes. It could be the cause and sometimes could be the effect of the uveal trauma. So uveal tissue is the most sensitive tissue in the eye, even in adults. If you, if you see that the vitrae, retinal surgeons do vitrectomy, nothing happens to their eyes because they do not touch the uveal tissue. We, the anti-segment surgeons, do not pay enough attention to the closed chamber technique and you will, and we produce all the complications, and that is accelerated in the extremes of age, pediatric population. Because I do all kinds of age and spectrum, I can tell you, you will irritation is the one of the initiating factor, including uh, even for EMT process in the lens epithelial cells. If it is that the thing, lens sector, should not be giving that. So, thank you. So let, uh, that was great. Boris, Ramesh, David, Rugit, I'm coming to all of you. What, what I think, do you operate yeah. on? Um, I think I cannot agree more with uh, Abai, and uh, for me, is, uh, seven to eight weeks is also uh, the threshold where I'm considering surgery. But I, I would like to point out and uh, the, the other side of uh, lens removal. We, we talk a lot about trauma and about inflammation and how uh, this can have some devastation, uh, devastative complications in, for the anterior chamber angle. But also by removing the lens, we actually are removing one uh, important structure uh, which, which uh, is involved in accommodative process. And I truly believe that uh, the lack of accommodation, uh, which is very important for the anterior chamber angle and for the function of the draining of intraocular fluid. And I think uh, that is one of the major long-term factors that, that cause uh, open angle glaucoma because there is no um, movement of ciliary body. Uh, there is no um, contraction and there is no active outflow from the anterior chamber, which is, uh, I believe, uh, one of the important factors to be considered. Yeah, Ramesh? Yeah, um, uh, Ken, if you are talking about uh, when I do operate on unilateral, if it is one number, I would say five weeks, but there is a range between many patients. It depends upon their uh, systemic health as well as eye health. If it is one number, I would say five weeks is a good uh, time for uh, surgery. In terms of uh, the inflammation, I would totally agree with the minimal steroid, but minimal steroid should not be three to four times. But we need to use, uh, because on the day of surgery or the first day of surgery, we don't see this inflammation. If you do a good cataract surgery, not touching the iris and things like that. But eventually after three, four days, they will come. I will also add one more uh, uh, line to this. The dilating drops are equally important to an extent that sometimes if I use the atropine drops, the chances of a baby developing glaucoma, I don't have a study, but it's just an observation that the chances of developing glaucoma is less. So enough steroids, very minimal to a UVL uh, handling and the dilating drops. These are the three crucial uh, things when you consider surgery. And I would just end with saying that there are two more questions when you are discussing. I, I like every audience to answer that question. Thank you, Ken. Sure. So uh, we're going to finish off the round on this one. And then if you can do the menti questions, Ramesh, is that okay? Yeah. So let's go to Rigitza before we go to David. We'll have, let David have the last word. Rigitza, in your uh, group, I know that you, you're the, you rehabilitate and the children. In your group, what, when do the surgeons operate? 
Again, I'm not the surgeon, so, and, and uh, so I would actually leave it to the rest of the surgeons in the group to talk about that. But of course, it's always uh, concerning the sensitivity to steroids. It's better if the, ch the child is older. It's the smallest one who gets it, the problems most often. And of course, they, we also want to operate early to, to save their vision. So it's this balance all the time. Um, but it's, uh, I would leave it to the surgeons in the panel here. Okay. Exactly to operate. All right. David, um, you said eight weeks. I just, before you go, before you answer that, I, I, the, the evidence in all the literature, there's a big meta-analysis done by Mina Matafsi from Greece, and there are other studies as well that are suggesting the risk of glaucoma goes up if you operate before four weeks of age. You're suggesting that in maybe we should leave it another four weeks because my limit is around six weeks for unilateral cataracts, eight to ten weeks in bilateral, equally symmetric cataracts. <coughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. It's, um, I, I think it's uh, one has to take a lot into consideration when you consider the timing of surgery. But my own choice is between two and three months, but one has to consider other factors. I think uh, the, the remarks and what you, I was going to add, what you just said, one thing that has faded away a little bit is the fact that these children are more at risk for glaucoma when operated on early. And every study has shown that, that that's the one common thread that appears in all the studies and the clinical reviews of patients. Early surgery uh, puts patient more at risk. Now, why is that? It could be loss of accommodation. That, that has been considered actively. And uh, uh, agents coming from the posterior chamber in the absence of a lens has been considered. One must fall back on the, uh, the clinical signs, which I just showed. Loss of accommodation and that kind of thing are not going to produce the physical changes that we see in the iris and we see in the angle. These are our striking physical changes. And in my view, only can be explained by uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, the alteration of lens cells into fibroblasts. And uh, it's interesting that a important question we've raised, well, why early? You know, the, the anterior chamber looks pretty clear, but it's actually a sea of cytokines. And it's very likely that the emergence of these cytokines it can be stimulated more abundantly early. The, the other thing is that the cells that cause this problem are, I suspect, are primarily the cells on the back of the anterior capsule. And those cells, which are really not lens cells, that they're really premature uh, uh, lens tissue, and they're the ones that are very reactive. So you have the release of there are these immature, very reactive cells into a sea of cytokines, which are probably more available. And I suspect that that's why we see the glaucoma when the children are operated on early. And uh, but uh, there's more to be said. But thank you for the opportunity to no, add. No, no, I think I think this is such an important discussion. Uh, Ramesh, would you like to share the last Menti questions? Yeah, uh, it's about the repeat question, whatever we have asked. Does it cause the adrenal suppression, the glucocorticoids? And how often we do gonioscopy? These are the last two questions. So, so, so uh, the audience, the session, I'll share the results. Thank you. For the audience out there, and again, I, I, I can tell you right now, I am getting messages from Macedonia, uh, Zambia, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, uh, uh, Mexico, uh, Philippines, Russia, Romania, Denmark, Sweden, Spain, uh, France, Italy. It's extraordinary the audience we have right now spanning right across the world. And, and what we're talking about isn't often talked about. So um, while uh, we, we are talking about this, I want to share with the audience uh, a picture of um, David's uh, seminal paper, uh, you know, everybody has uh, produced some amazing papers on this audience, but I want to show you this. Look at this. This is, if you look at this image, it's from David's paper. What they showed was that lens epithelial cells co-cultured uh, with an osmotic membrane between the actual uh, lens epithelial cells and trabecular meshwork cells. If this was done, the trabecular meshwork cells took on the appearance that you see in a 40 or 50 year old primary open angle glaucoma meshwork. So to me, this was, this, this was the moment that I realized 
that the surgical technique I was doing had to change, and I'm going to discuss with you what I mean by that. Here's, a, here's an angle picture. I'm going to go to Boris Ramesh first. Oh, oh, this is a unilateral uh, aphake, and the child is developing glaucoma. What do you, if I show you the other eye, that's his normal eye, and that is the child's affected eye. What would you do here? Before I come to Abe and uh, David and Rigitza. So the, what I, I want to point leave. out is David very clearly mentioned this ectropion. This ectropion to me is a sign that there's a fibrous membrane growing across the iris. And I have to thank David Walton because until I read his papers, I would never have done a goniotomy for this child. But I did the goniotomy, and Eva Ochna, who is an ex-fellow of mine, she's done the paper. We haven't published it yet. We showed control uh, of glaucoma with drops. But I think David's right. The earlier you do it, the more important it is. Boris, ever seen anything like this? Uh, yeah, you, I just, you just took the words from my, from my mouth because I, I was about to suggest goniotomy in that case. And I, obviously, this is a good example when, when it will... We expect it to work. Um, Abhi, um, Rigitza, and um, David, Ramesh, any comments? I'm going to take the picture down, but I, I wanted people to start looking for this ectropion as a sign that there's been this transformation of the lens epithelial cells. Ken, please leave the picture up. because but, I, 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 would suggest, sorry. I would suggest you leave the picture because the picture is really excellent and it does show the ectropion it shows the curling of the anterior iris surface and most important it shows the circumferential anterior reinsertion of the iris and, and uh, one other thing it shows which you would expect to see is the white under the iris well, where does that come from that that's another that's more evidence of really normal uh in uh fibrosis occurring at the inner at the contact of the anterior lens capsule and posterior capsule. This process of EMT or uh, fibrosis formation of lens, this is, a normal, this is a normal process that occurs pathologically. In the infants, it occurs in excess uh, and uh, causing what we see in the iris. The iris changes and angle changes are, are changes we do not see in adults, but we see the, uh, we do see the, the uh, lens membrane formation in the pupil. This is such an excellent picture and it tells the whole story. And this patient certainly is a candidate for a goniotomy. Uh, Abhi? I think <clears throat> I cannot agree more, but I just want again, from a cell biology point of view, tell that EMT process occurs in iris epithelial cells, lens epithelial cells, wherever they are. So the ectropion is a hallmark of EMT, but not necessarily of lens epithelial cell EMT. It could be the iris cells itself. But the fact is that look for ectropion, it's a, it's a pool, it's an EMT, and therefore, if you do goniotomy, it, it will work. But the white thing you see is a capsular EMT, which you see quite often in all kinds of cataract surgery. So, so EMT in the lens epithelial cells, EMT in the uveal tissue, everything contributes. It is not only really one EMT at one particular source of epithelial cells. In the cellular environment, everything is contributing. But, but this is a great shot, David, uh, uh, documented that ectropia and the sign of uh, EMT, and, and, and it is terrific. That's a great stuff. Uh, Ramesh, uh, Ragitza? Yeah, uh, just uh, two comments here. Uh, one of the thing is uh, many of these pupils are meiotic. When you see them, uh, aphakic patients or pseudophakic, unless you do a gonioscopy, you will not even see. Because sometimes when you do a secondary IUL, we think it's a posterior sinica. Actually, it's a ectropian uvea. That's one thing we need to remember. Second thing is very similar thing happens when you have ROP cataract. Cataract associated with the retinopathy of prematurity. I believe it's because of the vitreous factor as well, because that's also one of the factor. It's like a cyclitic membrane forms there. And sometimes in an extreme stage, they will go into hypotony as well. So these are the two comments I had about this. Otherwise, I completely agree with the 
all these uh, things have been said. Rigitsit, um the question I want to I ask you. Go ahead. Sorry. I agree too, but I would like to take the opportunity to say that it would be really nice if when we study um, glaucoma in congenital cataract, if we had protocols who were very strict on how much, what steroid we use so we can compare to leave out the, 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 the influence of steroids. Agreed. And uh, even the infant aphakia study, the children got really very uh, diverse uh, uh, steroid regimens. And um, but it's and I will all, we, uh, all agree that we should use a li as little steroids as possible. But it's of course, if if uh, in a in a department they have used um, a steroid regimen for many years and it works, it's really uh, difficult to start cutting down because you don't know what you can expect. So I think it's brilliant from from our surgeons that they dared cut very much down on the steroid regimen and it works very well we even think we might we, we are looking at the data right now but we definitely haven't got more glaucoma and we probably have got less and and not more complications and not from a clinical point of view so th there are questions coming in for you Rigid. so people are asking do you think a depot steroid makes a difference i mean uh, i'm going to stop sharing this picture for a minute but do you think a, a depo steroid makes a difference? Do you, do you guys give depo steroids? We did, and and it it had an influence. So so that's partly why we could reduce it. It's a very high dose actually. Normally, what's given uh, uh, under this uh, conjunctiva, when you uh, mention it to the endocrinologist, they they are really surprised we give so much. So, uh, and, and it didn't matter in our department to leave it out. So, um, but even dexamethasone is very potent and, and a lot of cases in the literature is, is exactly de dexamethasone. For, but in, in Denmark, that's our primary um, available uh, eye drops. And so it, it was... I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So, um, uh, we're going to start wrapping up. So, I, what I want everybody to think about is what is your preferred steroid regimen when when you're dealing with infant cataracts and let's just talk about lensectomy let's not talk about uh whether using an iol or not um but while we do that the the, the uh, david the questions come to you is what do you think that this change that i showed you and that you've noticed ca occurs in children who are over one or just in the infants under three months under six months well, it's, a very, <clears throat> it's a very good question, of course, and uh, you know we don't really operate very frequently, and this this cohort of patients often are not between one and two years of age at the time of surgery, so there are very few patients in that in-between age, and I'm not really certain whether or not it, it occurs. It potentially could occur because we get the fibers change in the residual lens tissue, but I don't characteristically see it in children uh, who are older, over one year of age. Okay, um, Ramesh, let's go to you um, about what's your regimen, steroid yeah. regimen? Yeah, I, I use an infant somewhere between 6 to 11 or 12 times sometimes, depending upon the inflammation. But in an older kids, uh, I'm happy with uh, just six times. Obviously, always with dilating agents. In infants, I use atropine. So Any periocular uh, drops at the end of the operation? Yes, uh, uh, th that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, I give a periocular steroid after the injection because uh, after the surgery, because at least for the next six or eight hours, people, the children may not use the eye drops. So it gives a good control of inflammation. So I use that. And I don't use the depot steroids. And uh, the, the steroid what I use is prednisolone acetate. I don't use uh, dexamethasone. David? Uh, I, uh, I use prednisolone acetate. I use it twice a day in combination with florbuprofen uh, as an additional anti-inflammatory agent. And I, I continue the steroids for one week, then discontinue it and continue the florbuprofen for a month. The florbuprofen is 0.03%. Uh, it's given twice a day again for one month. So I see very little inflammation in these patients after surgery. Boris? Uh, I usually do um, uh, use dexamethasone, 0.1%, uh, 
and I use it for three weeks. And also, I like to add non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs and continue them for uh, six to seven weeks. And uh, by, by that discussion, I was thinking about why, why not we using intracameral uh, dexamethasone. Uh, I think maybe... So, <laughs> so, Boris, you say that. I've been using intracameral dexamethasone since 2008. I use uh, one to two milligrams preservative-free. Um, uh, and I just use uh, dexamethasone, tobramycin combination, four times a day, reducing to w once a day over three weeks. Um, that's what I do. If I use an implant, then I give one milligram per kilogram of triamcinolone in the orbital floor, but only one milligram per kilogram. Um, Rigitza, we, we, we've heard yours. I'm going to go to Abe. Abe, what do you use? Well, I used to give intracameral... Uh or a cord, triamcinol, and I stopped it because the IOP is a concern, even if you inject a little bit. But at the moment, what I do is 70% dose intravenous dexamethasone on table at the end of the surgery, and first day, four times prednisolone acetate and atropine drops, and I heavily depend on atropine for at least two weeks, uh, at least once a day, sometimes twice a day, depending upon the surgical performance. And then after two weeks, we reduce the prednisolone to three times and then taper it off. But until six weeks, the child is on some once a day or twice a day, but uh, heavily atropine. I do not give non I, I I caution you giving diclofenac and all the kind of thing because they are renal toxic in children. So I would not depend too much on non steroidal drops in children. Ramesh, I think we have some menti answers, right? Yeah, I will uh, go ahead with that. Um, so I'm getting more messages. We have, uh, let's see, we now have people from Russia, Iraq, Vietnam, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, UK, Greece. Well, uh, it, it's phenomenal. The, the, the People are asking so many questions. The questions will be answered. We'll send a, if you send, we, we, all these questions will be collated and the experts will answer them on a PDF. So you will get the answers, uh, Ramesh? Yeah. Uh, the main question, there are seven questions. The first question, where are you from? Uh, what do you do? 80% uh, of the people today are uh, pediatric ophthalmologists trained, and 20% are uh, people who are adult ophthalmologists who does uh, pediatric care. And we do have some optometrists and orthoptists and uh, other managerial people as well. Geographic location, uh, most of the people are from Asia, but we have equal distribution from Europe, Middle East, uh, equal contribution from, equal presence from South America, North America, and Africa, and a small percentage from Australia. Uh, understandably so, they are sleeping. It's almost one name there. Uh, pediatric cataract surgery, when there is a small pupil, uh, there is a 50% uh, people use iris hooks and the rest of the 40% use intracameral agents. 5% of the people do pupilloplasty. 10% use malugin ring. And preoperative atropine, this we did not discuss. I think that's a good tool to use preoperative atropine to have a good dilatation. And 5% use other technology. We don't know what is it. In terms of gonioscopy before pediatric cataract surgery, uh, I think 20% always do it. Next, 23% uh, does in selected cases. 15% rarely do it. And close to 45%, they don't do it at all. That's interesting. First management choice in pseudophagic or aphagic glaucoma if medical therapy fails. Majority are uh, doing trabeclectomy. The next common is interesting. It's gonios, goniotomy. And 25% for tube implant and uh, less than 5% for cyclodiode laser. Can topical steroids cause adrenal suppression? Uh, 35% don't know, 25% said no, and 30% said yes, it can cause. 
And when I ask the repeat question, do I do gonioscopy before pediatric cataract surgery? I think uh, everything has uh, improved. Uh, the rarely and the never group has reduced by 20%. So that's a good thing that uh, we are encouraging. Uh, still, some of the people are answering. So people are tending to do more of gonioscopy. And the last question, can topical steroids cause adrenal suppression? At this point of time, 85% say yes. And 5% say no. Still 12%. It's increasing now. 12% still don't know about that. Thank you so much for uh, this answering this. We, we have an idea now. Well, you've had a, a positive effect uh, on the audience. So congratulations, panelists. Um, we, we, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So um, before Ramesh starts, I, I want to tell everybody one thing. The iris is really important, as everybody has said. Please ask your anesthesia to paralyze these patients and keep the PCO2 at 30 or less. If it's higher than that, there are anesthetic studies that show that there's positive vitreous pressure and the iris gets pushed out of your wounds. Okay, so that's just a hint. There's plenty of stuff in the literature. Over to you, uh, Ramesh. Thank you, Ken. Uh, a final few slides before we close. I still request people to answer this uh, many questions. Uh, so that uh, we can get, it will be open for some more time. We will get the real uh, trend. Some more people can answer. Uh, we would like to tell the participants that uh, we will uh, arrange the attendance or participation certificate. You all can email to wspos at wspos.org. We will send it to you in a few days. And uh, I would like to draw your attention for the future webinars. We are still uh, uh, going ahead with some more uh, uh, webinars. The next week we have one more session on pediatric cataract surgery and we are starting with genetics and retinopathy of the maturity and neuroophthalmology. We will keep updating this uh, few upcoming webinars. I sincerely request all of you to be there for this. And finally, uh, before Ken signs off, I would like to thank everyone on this panel and I would like to thank you all from around the world for participating in this. Uh, it's, it's a great session what we had. And thank you for all the lovely questions. We are going to answer them uh, in a few days and we will send us the PDF. And as always, uh, I would like to uh, thank the NTOR team who have uh, been completely supportive and they are hosting this uh, webinar one after the other with a lot of technical uh, support from, the, from their team. Thank you so much. And I would like to end by saying uh, thank you to our WSPS admin team uh, who, is, uh, who are working round the clock. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Ken. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, my last uh, uh, couple of slides. Uh, uh, the admin team, I want to thank Dara by name and Akila. You're amazing. Listen, guys, we are trying to get this survey done. This is for the first six webinars. This is the link. It's underscore here between the V and the E. Please take part so that we can try and make things better for you. Now, I want you to remember two things. WSPS Worldwide Connect is coming. You're going to be hearing more details about that. We're going to have CME for you. We are going to culminate in the first week in October. Remember, we are not doing the face-to-face um, we're doing the connect and um, I want you to remember that uh, you are very important to us and that you make this society what it is. I want to thank everybody on the panelists. I could have kept talking to and listening to these amazing people for much longer than we've had, but I want to say um, a, a very, very important uh, thank you to each and every one of you. You really have contributed uh, amazingly to pediatric ophthalmology as a whole and today thank you for giving us your time. Um, uh, my last slide which I have uh, not put up, remember there's the listserv, uh, contact David Granite, contact anybody here on WSPOS to become members, uh, remember to do the survey, we're going to do WW Connect, remember next week's webinar is the more surgical aspects of pediatric cataract surgery. But today's is the thing that we don't normally talk about. Thank you so much. God bless and keep safe.
Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.